Hello and welcome to another installment of The Trading Desk. This is episode 49, guys. This is absolutely insane. 49. My name is Joshua Thanos, your regular host. And the guy next to me here, my spiritual advisor, my guru, <laughs> my cult leader, Israel Colon. Israel, introduce yourself to, to the people. I think you did that for me, but mm-hmm. uh, it's a pleasure to be here. All right, be closer to the mic, I think. Oh. Hello, hey. humans. So, uh... Israel is the director of operations at our company. You've been with Godbergs for how long? Five years. Five years. And you're from Philadelphia? Born and raised. Born and raised in Philadelphia. And uh, he was uh, one of the guys who made my transition uh, <laughs> my transition very easy. Uh, shout out to, uh, to all those transitioning out there. <laughs> um, no, but moving from uh, South Florida to uh, Philadelphia, he is – and the uh, – he's the <laughs> – the uh, the third musketeer between me, you, and Jason. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Behind yeah. the scenes. That's right. So, uh, yeah, Jason does. Josh looks a bit different. So does Jason here, guys. So Jason's in the chat box. He's uh, watching uh, from South Florida, getting ready for our camping trip. Can't wait to share a tent with Jason Maine. It's going to be fun. I feel like I'm missing out. My, my, it's going to be awkward with my wife in there, too, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> That'd be tight. All right, guys. So, uh, again, another episode of The Trading Desk. Today, we're going to have an interesting conversation about... Hype. Yeah. The hype. But first, as always, wrist check. And as a guest, we're going to check your wrist. There you go. Oh. My boy's going to hit you with the. Get a little. Oh, wait. Hey. So, Iz, what do you got on the wrist, man? Uh, this would be a Submariner. Okay. A Rolex Submariner. Not a Ro- Rolex Submariner. No date. I know Jason last week uh, had Mike Manjos on, and he referred to it as the no date. But you don't this like is that? The, this is the true Submariner. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have a date, though, so. Yeah, it also doesn't have a, a chronograph, but it's not the, <laughs> the, ah. the, the, the no chronograph, right? You got me there. Okay, fair enough. All right, and yeah. well, if you guys follow me on social media, on Instagram, you'll see that I posted about, what, two weeks ago? I started posting pictures. Yeah. Wearing? I changed your mind. That's right. So I wasn't a huge fan of the watch, and right as I was leaving the building, I said, hey, Iz, you want to you want to wear a Panerai for a week? So he goes, sure. So he gives me his no date sub, and I wore that thing, and I. I, I just felt bad. <laughs> to be honest, so I let you wear it. Is that right? You yeah. didn't like this. You didn't like the uh, the I, Panerai. I, I love it. It's She's vintage. a vintage. It, it looks worn. Patina, water it damage. Patina. It's water damage. Is what that water is. damage. That's but, right. Uh, well, I took you, care of that for you. So actually, guys, quick note: Israel's the one who restored that watch or got that watch Myself. restored for me. Yeah, Myself. <laughs> you did it I within did it. your yeah. basement. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, well, I mean, not to throw anybody under the bus, but I had. Well, Tim wanted to take the, take on the uh, the challenge first. Sat in his office for six months, and I decided, you know what, man, you're too busy. Let's yeah. let's move. So Mike Michaels then had the watch for another about year. Again, a little too busy for for their good old friend Josh. Yeah. Well, and then is Israel busy, came to my rescue. I sent it out though. That's right, you did. Yeah. yeah, and it came back looking fantastic. Oh yeah, they were able to salvage a lot more than we thought. So. Oh, man. it was yeah. I'm yeah. absolutely thrilled with it. So we got to right. work on those hands. <laughs> oh yeah, well we no. got a patina of the hands. We had no, I have the hands. We have the original ones, but we swapped oh, yeah, them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, man, we know what we're doing. I just want a little bit of loom. I need a little bit of loom there. I got a seat. All right, so, but we are doing wrist checks. So, on my wrist, if you guys noticed from last week, I still have the same Rolex 116334 41mm Datejust 2. This is not the and this is not the current Datejust 41. This is the Datejust 2. Uh, silver dial, lilac numerals, and as uh, Jason pointed out last week, the 6 is upside down. So is the 7. The 5, the 4, the 8. The nine sideways, but uh, and I, you know what? Every day I wear this watch, I love it a little bit more. Normally, my routine is uh, when I fly up to Philadelphia that I br- I bring three watches with me. This week, I only brought this watch, and I've been wearing this every day. So Sounds I'm back like on the Rolex train. Yeah, I made a commitment. <laughs> made a commitment. I am a committed man, but I don't know. I just I love it. The only thing is, it's I would like. I've been thinking now about adding a No Date sub. Yeah. I think that uh, like a nice two watch collection could be my Day Trust and a No Date sub, and I could just end up wearing that all the time. Straight Rolex. Yeah. Or I was thinking about maybe selling everything and buying a Richard Mill. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Let's talk about that. Yeah, right. All right, guys. So uh, this week's show, we're going to be talk. We're, it's going to be heavy on the main topic. We're not talking about top five. We're not doing this or that. We're jumping right into it. So our main topic today is don't buy the hype, guys. So today we're comparing watches that are super hyped, high price points, right? And against yeah. their comparables at much lower price points. So we have a few watches we want to we yeah, want to pull up, but uh, we'll see where the conversation in. goes from there. So the first watch we want to start with, right, is a dress watch, which we decided was a mistake for your first watch in the past. 
But I don't know. Is a yeah, chronograph I, is a chronograph a, uh, a dress watch? Is it, it? It all depends. You know, uh, these two watches, I would say, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So let's pull up the graphic, guys. All right. So what do we have here on the screen? We have a Patek Philippe fifty seventy. Uh, it's the white or silver dial, so it's a 001 dial, and, and that's in white gold, 5070G. And we're going to compare that with its very comparable watch, and we'll find out why, the 47192, white gold as well, so the, the slash 000G, and uh, this is the Patrimony Chronograph. So you see these two watches is, what do you think? First impressions of both First of these impression. watches. Both 42 uh, millimeters, both white gold, both from high horology manufacturers, absolutely. and... Two manufacturers that at one point were part of the Holy Trinity. I don't know if Fashion is anymore. It's, that's a debate for another show. But what's your initial thoughts on these two watches? So initial response is, uh, be it as though they're both white gold, mm -hmm. it's it's just the color, the brilliance of the white gold. Okay. Um, I greatly appreciate the, the metallurgy of Rolex, Patek, mm -hmm. their ability to have a brilliant white color without uh, rhodium plating mm -hmm. however it it doesn't look like white gold i got and, you you know so so as it's I like look at the vast stealth wealth it, exactly that's and I in the that. paddock right yeah. so the paddock is not rhodium plated yeah. so as the director of operations israel runs basically our, our service department so yeah. he knows a lot about what goes into refinishing the watches servicing and things so yeah. these are things that i it you know what? I may have heard that Paddock doesn't rhodium plate, but they I did, never they, remember. They used to rhodium plate. Uh, they've since transitioned. I, I don't know when. So this one, so this watch was discontinued. I think in two thousand and nine. I think it was ninety eight to two thousand nine. I think so. It might be rhodium plated, but you can see Ooh, the finishes are yeah. absolutely different on the two on the two models. Um, but so. I'm so the cool first thing is the, Va the Vacheron. Though. You like the Vacheron. I like the way that the, the white gold looks. You mm -hmm. just see that hue of gold in there. Yeah. And I don't know. It pops. I got you. Yeah. Well, so the, obviously the design is going to be different. You're going to have a step bezel, step lugs on yeah. the on the paddock. Um, you have well. So before we get too far, yeah. the main the the main topic of what we're talking about is basically buying the hyped watch versus the unhyped watch and the price differential. So if you want to own the 5070G, you're going to have to come out of pocket roughly $70,000. So the watch holds fantastic value from the original retail. That's what that's what you get with Paddock. But if you want to own the the Vacheron Patrimony Chronograph with, by the way, guys, the exact same movement, both Lemania movements, and yep. uh, while the Paddock, all, every single 5070 that was Great manufactured movements. did have a Geneva seal, not every, not every um, Vacheron... Uh, Patrimony Chrono did, but if you can identify them, like for ours, the one that we have here does. So both watches, literally the same movements, same level of finishing, because yep. same movements, both Lamani movements. Um, and you're gonna pay $28,000 for that watch. Both 42 millimeter white gold chronos from amazing manufacturers, but Patek Philippe right now is so unbelievably hyped that you're going to pay more than double for, I mean, we're not going to say the same watch because there's obviously design elements that are different as well as the is the name brand, but 85 percent, 90 percent of the same watch. I, I don't. I mean, look, when you like something, mm -hmm. like why are you buying it? If it's an investment piece, I think you know mm -hmm. which one to buy. Sure. Um, if just emotionally you're pulled in in one way or the other, you got to follow it. I mean, I think that's when you get buyer's remorse is when you're like, ah, I'm not sure, and then you're sold on an idea. Oh yeah. But it. it it is an authentic, mm -hmm. um, but that the the price difference between the two. I mean, so you could buy, so you can go ahead and buy the Vacheron along with a. You could probably get yourself a new Jeep with the Vacheron for the same price that you. We were just talking about. That. That's right. So I mean, the price differential is so like if they were close, I'd say always go for the Paddock. Yeah. But man, you're talking about less than. Less than half of the money that you're going to spend on that on that paddock. And by the way, uh, we like Mike Manjos came on the show with, uh, with uh, uh, Jason a few weeks ago. And future collectible watch, even at a seventy thousand dollars purchase purchase price, that watch I believe in twenty years from now will be worth more. Will be worth more. Yeah, it's yeah, unbelievable. I'm, I'm a stickler for height mm -hmm. as well, and the Vacheron is uh, absolutely thinner. I'm looking at the specs, and we're going from. Uh, 12.75 millimeters okay. with the, the Patek and 10.6 with 
with the Vacheron. Vacheron. Well, you and are. I, I know on the love yeah a thin, thin watch. watch. I agree it with you when it comes with it. It's yeah, beautiful. I agree 100 percent in that regard. So what you are going to get in terms of the the fit of both watches, the Patek does wear a bit chunkier. So you, again, you're going to have the step bezel. It feels a little shorter and chunkier, whereas the Vacheron, all the patrimonies are going to feel like like flat discs on your wrist. Which, if I'm it, if I'm picking just price unconsidered, and if there's no name on the dial, I, I like okay. the I like the the feel of a of a patrimony over a Calatrava for that for that yeah. sake. But um, all right, so These there you go. Dress watches. They are both dress watches. All right. So, so cool. again, you're gonna pick for for seventy thousand dollars. You can have the fifty seventy G, a, a future collectible for sure. Or for twenty eight thousand dollars, roughly less than thirty thousand dollars, you're gonna have a uh, the Vacheron, and also could be a, f a future collectible. All right. What's the uh, what do we have up next? So those are the two first going. two comparables. Second two comparables also same brands. All right. Let's and you're seeing obviously Patek Philippe right now is just through the roof. In terms of hype, when it, this is a much more hyped watch, the Nautilus that you see here, than the 5070. Not every, like you have to be a real, so right now what we're seeing in the market is it's not being dominated by collectors, it's being dominated by speculators, right? So that's when you see the 5711, so a steel sport watch. It's gonna be not the highest level of finishing from Paddock. And so this is roughly $10,000 less than what you can spend on the Lamagna Movement Chrono from, uh, from Paddock. Also, by the way, one thing we wanted to I wanted to add is that they made 250 of those chronos per year, and that that was like roughly a 10 year run. So there's 2,500 of those in in existence. Whereas the the Nautilus is going to be uh, churned out at a higher rate, even though Absolutely. just the demand is so much higher. So that's why they feel like there's some scarcity, but they churn those out at a higher rate. They're making more than 250 Nautilus per year. But let's bring the graphic back up again. So the second comparables we're going to have here. Is you have the, the 5711 40 millimeter. Uh, this is essentially the the steel sport watch from Paddock uh, versus the overseas, the 4500V. So this is the new overseas. Yeah. Big differences between these watches, M huge. So the watches, the first watch was very very similar. Huge differences between these watches, other than the fact that they are the signature sport watch, time and time and date sport watch from the brands. We have some massive differences. Number one, cost. Right now, market price for the uh, for the 5711 is $60,000. For this, for the white dial. The white dial is less in demand than the blue dial, Israel. So you got $60,000 for that watch. Uh, in some cases, some people believe, believe or say that this is the worst $60,000 watch you can buy, but there's a lot of hype there. Yeah, Next to it, you have a watch that, in-house movement as well, much more engineering. You'll get into that in a second. Yeah. For market price of around sixteen five. So basically uh, we're talking about five times almost the difference. Four and a half times the difference of uh, uh, in dollars spent and you're gonna get a 41 millimeter much higher rated dive watch. Uh, and I mean the, the engineering that goes into these watches. Yeah. Why don't you to go into that real quick? Is I mean let, let's just talk about uh, the aesthetics, the, the craftsmanship and, and the refinishing. Mm -hmm. um, I learned this very quickly when I got into the watch industry, um, just the the techniques and everything that goes into to making the refinishing look the way that it does. Sure. The bracelet alone on on that Vacheron, yeah, is a marvel. Oh yeah. You know the way that the the high gloss meets the satin, the angles like there are ways to do this in a very easy. Uh, manner, mm -hmm. such as just taking two separate pieces of metal and putting them together. Sure. Screw, pin, whatever. And that's very much what you see on the paddock. So those center uh, licks there, so it's... So to it, get the almost like a similar style effect, yeah. so Vacheron went above and beyond and created bevels on one piece of metal, whereas yeah, you're saying paddock absolutely. has inserted metal pieces to get like a contrast. Yeah. Oh, you know now, what? I never thought about that the way. Yeah, it's really no, interesting. It's, I appreciate it. It's very artistic. Mm -hmm. There's a value there, without a doubt. For the Vacheron. Um, yeah, even the bezel, when you look at the the bezel and, and the use of the, the high polish and the satin, the way they meet each other there, I do believe the bezel is a separate piece from the case, so uh, from the, uh, the, the portion behind it. Therefore, it's not as much of a technical marvel. Okay. But aesthetically, it, it is pleasing. Well, they're both Gerald Genta designs, right? So that's so that's one thing that they share in common. Obviously, they both have white dials. I'd say the what goes into the, each dial is going to be a lot as well. Yeah, There's a texture sure. dial for the paddock. You're going to have more of a flat 
uh, uh, like a mat dial for the uh, for the Vacheron. I mean, they wear a little bit. So the the paddock is going to wear a little bit slimmer. It might be a little bit more everyday wearable yeah, in terms I, of the, the the wearability. I look at at the paddock, and you know, I I get to see a lot of these. Sure, I get to play with them, and uh, <laughs> the beauty is they haven't been serviced yet. So yeah. if, if I scratch one, it's not a big deal. But sure. um, it 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 melts on the wrist. Yeah, you know, and the Vacheron in this case, it, I like the it's way a you little put more it melts disruptive the to the eye. Sure, and it it's like you're you're looking at two different pieces of art here, two different uh, of styles of art. Mm -hmm. And me personally, I, I'm I'm signing with the Paddock. It just when I wear a watch, I it I kind of want it to disappear, mm -hmm. but when I look at it, I really want to see it. Sure. So you're set. You're you're spending half of your salary on that watch. I'm. You, you go screw it. You you're feel. going for it. Okay. And yeah, Israel's more like, of a uh, touchy feely guy. Go, go with the that. feel. You, right. You'll never regret uh, regret doing something okay. if you're doing it based on how you feel. So a couple different, uh, a couple other uh, differences you see. Um, uh, Paddock moved from uh, screws in their links mm -hmm. to uh, to pins, which is, yep. in my opinion, uh, sucks. <laughs> I hate it. I love having <laughs> screws. I like to be able to change the no. take links out myself. Vacheron and there's there's our removable links similar to how Rolex is. So most of the bracelet is is non removable links, and there's going to be on the bottom end there's yeah. going to be some removable links. Whereas Vacheron, again, I've said this before. I've said this years ago when I started doing this show with Tim. Vacheron, uh, the uh, the overseas has the greatest bracelet in watches. It's beautiful. It's unbelievable the amount of uh, craftsmanship that goes into that design. Every single link on that watch is removable. Can you believe that? Every single link. I think it's very important because not only do you need to make sure you have the right amount of uh, of links, but also having a well balanced uh, buckle or like having a well balanced yeah, bracelet no, is absolutely. super important. So this is. Thank you, by the way. Yeah, you're really right. I balance that for you. I you hate did. that, dude. Yeah. Somebody gives me a watch to wear for a little while, and it's a bracelet watch. I have to balance a bracelet. I didn't even realize it to be honest, but yeah. uh, it's it's a huge difference. Yeah, so no, the, amazing. So here we have. I mean, I think that Israel picks the paddock, but I think hands down for the yeah, price we're, we're for the price money. differential. Yeah, I mean, you can't argue dude, that value for dollars that Vacheron, and on top of it, we didn't even say the technology that goes into the third gen is you have a uh, quick release bracelet and two extra uh, uh, leather and a rubber uh, bra or strap that comes with these oh watches, so you can wear it to the beach without worrying about scratching up your total your the bracelet. Power reserve difference. Oh, that's right. What do you have a seventy hour versus uh, like a fifty hour? Sixty versus four uh, forty. So 60 on the Vacheron? Um, 45 and 60. Okay. Yeah, 60 on the Vacheron. I mean, look, without a doubt, you are, you're you getting a lot for your money. Value for dollars. Absolutely. In comparison. Absolutely, oh, yeah. dude. I but, mean, you know, it's so, all right. So with that's these your two, guiding principle, buy the Vacheron. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Do we have any? Are you on the chat, Is? Oh, you know, I've been looking at my notes. Okay. But ah, what do we uh, got going notes, on? Notes, man. What what is it like to prepare for something? I don't ah, really, we don't really. I don't I, really prepare. I try for not show. to leave anything up to chance. Oh man, see, I'm the opposite here. There you go, yin and yang. All right, guys. So so far we have two paddocks. Uh, we have the uh, 5070G versus the uh, Vacheron Patrimony Chrono. And my opinion, the Vacheron wins hands down there, especially for like a half of the price. When it comes to these two watches, undoubtedly the 5711 versus the Vacheron 4500V. The Vacheron wins. I mean, I, even even at the same price point, I'd probably take the Vacheron. If they're both sixteen thousand dollars, roughly, really? I would like the Vacheron over the over the paddock. But at the price point differentials, it's insane. It's completely. insane. I think your experience would be very similar to the No Ding. Oh, on the paddock, the paddock is nice. I, listen, I've worn I've worn an Alice before. I really really like it. But in, if I I'm get it, I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I, I believe me. I I listen. You put a paddock on. First of all, you put both these watches on. There's no, they're neither of them are bad watches. Oh no, absolutely not. I mean, we're splitting hairs here, but yeah. All right. So uh, next one, next comparison here. So, what else is the next, the next value for dollars piece? Ah, so now we have something very interesting. And honestly, all right. Why don't you introduce these two watches because oh, no, I have no, some no, interesting no, no. comments here. No, please, you go. Okay. Um, all right. So we have. I'm a counter so Now we have <laughs> some like small boutique uh, independence. Right, you have uh, FP Journe versus Moser and C, and uh, you have French Swiss and FP Journe with an attitude, okay, and you have uh, German Swiss with an attitude, but not in their watches, right? So you have two similar manufacturers, more similar than people realize in terms of like their 
like I don't give a shit the, attitude. Yeah, their, for, their by, confidence exudes their, attitude. Oh, oh unbelievably. Both, but on both ends. So yeah. Moser is likes throwing double middle fingers at the Swiss industry, Swiss watch industry. They love doing there that. And Jordan throws double middle fingers at anybody who'll walk by his <laughs> walk by his manufacturer, man. So a lot of attitude with these watches. You have in terms of the hype, Jorn has been growing over the last few Absolutely. years. So here we have uh, a watch that was owned by a good friend of mine, actually, and one you just met, Shelby. Oh, Shelby. My buddy Shelby has owned this watch. Little actually, he, I think this specific watch that we have on our website, he owned this one. So uh, so you have the black label Platinum CS, the chronometer souverain. So the black label uh, is, if, you, if you're not familiar, no, is – uh, so – Jorn has an in-house dial in case manufacturer, so their dials are very important. So they, so he limits certain dials to certain watches. Uh, so the black label is a is a uh, is a term used uh, or a label used for platinum watches with these deep dark, dark black dials, which they never did before. And actually, the reason they rolled them out, I believe, for for their first Russian boutique, and then they ended up making them like a special, like a on on call or a. Uh, like a application piece. So what what you get with the black label Jorn, you not only do you get the watch, you get a special li very limited piece because the watches are limited as they are. They make makes less than 900 mechanical watches in a year. You also get certificate hand signed by Jorn himself. So it's not like you go to the boutique and you get a stamp, which yeah, is great. This is legit. This is legit. Yeah. This is a yeah. hand signed document from the man himself, the double middle fingers FP Jorn himself. And on top of that, you're going to get no, okay, so we've talked about that before. Jorn starts, uh, it starts designing his watches dial out. So he creates a dial, so it's all aesthetic. Same thing with his cases. They fit, they feel amazing. Then he f makes a movement to fit the, uh, fit the watch. So you're going to get a watch that's made from the inside out, essentially, as opposed to the outside in. Um, so you're going to get, a, 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 what is it, a 40 millimeter platinum case. Um, very distinctive look as well. So it's a dress watch, but it does have some warmth to it, too. It's French. So you get some of that French warmth. We're comparing, and, and that's at a price point, roughly a um, uh, a, a price point of uh, thirty three thousand or the low thirties. Um, the uh, you're going to get a price point of low thirties for the Jorn and a um, an unbelievable watch, very very limited, right, and a lot of hype. Okay, next to it, in in house movement. Uh, hand finished, along with some machine finishing, but in-house movement. Power reserve, I believe the, the full power reserve is 56 hours, but it's a chronometer for 40 hours roughly, so that's why it's a 40-hour power reserve on the dial. Okay, manual wine. Next to it, incomparable. So if you, say you see that watch, you want that watch, but you're like, missing man, I, ca I can't drop 30 grand on a watch right now. What's your alternative? The Moser. So when you look at the Moser, it maybe doesn't look as fine. No. It, aesthetically, it doesn't pop for me. No. It's a little bit cold. So what you're getting is German uh, German Swiss yeah. manufacturing, so that's number one. Okay, you're going to get a a very refined dial, a very clean dial that you always get with Moser. You're going to have a case. The lugs are a little bit less pronounced. The dials a little bit more pronounced. The crowns a little bit more pronounced. But again, it's it's a little bit of of it, it's it's colder, right? When you say yeah, it, right. yeah. But that's you're also very, yeah, yeah it's, it's a colder feel. Yeah, you don't absolutely. get the warmth of the Jorn. You're also getting half the price point, and that's that's the main point of what we're talking about here. Is that you can get a 40 millimeter manual wine in-house movement. This one has a seven-day power reserve, so that's the thing. So you're getting a little bit more manufacturing in the Moser as well. The small manufacturer they make less than Jorn's. I believe they only make like 200 watches a year, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. We get a reference, Tim. If you don't, if if you have any questions about anything I'm saying or yeah, think I'm something wrong, just email Tim. He'll tell you the answer. Um, so. The, the uh, Moser, you're going to have a seven, roughly seven-day power reserve, uh, finished roughly the same as a Jorn, right? Platinum case as well, and for literally half the price. So, Israel, if you got to do a this or that with these uh, with these two watches, where are you at? I'm going with the Jorn. You are? I am. I am. Look, so you're just going with your heart every time, it seems like. Yeah, you have you're to. You're one of those but, guys. No, but, I mean, look, it, it's double, right? Yeah. That's not the worst we've seen thus far. That's true. Right? That's true. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I look at the Moser, and I don't know, it, it doesn't pull me the way the Jorn does. Sure. Right? Um, I appreciate the utility in the crown of mm -hmm. the Moser. Sure. Um, however, it doesn't quite fit the case, in my opinion. Um, you have a nice even balance and flow, and then it, just kind of this mass off, off onto the side. Um, even in, in finishing, because I'm always looking at, at the way the metal's finished. Sure. The serrations on the Jorn 
lend itself to to less of a a shine or a reflection. Mm -hmm. So more depth. So yeah, you yeah you can focus more so on uh, the watch head itself, the case, uh, the 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 dial. Um, you can get lost in looking at the hands. Mm -hmm. um, not as much there on the Moser. I mean, I'm looking at the the crown. I'm just like, oh, there it is. It's it's, it's popping <laughs> I, out. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's popping out, and uh, there are some. Uh, some some serrations in it but mm -hmm. there's still some high polish towards the case it's just catching my eye um but you know outside of the aesthetics i mean when you look at uh, more of the uh the the technical specs of the watches right. i mean there's a lot there there's mm -hmm. a lot to be had with the moser um again i mentioned uh, i'm big on the height both are very thin watches yeah i think uh the Jorn wins ever so slightly um, hard to compare mm -hmm. without them in hand, um, but just knowing Jorn, well, it's, yeah. I've handled both these watches. I think that the decision is actually a little bit closer than most people think. If you haven't put a Moser on your wrist, it, the in pictures don't really do it justice. Um, though, I would have to agree with you, man. The Jorn, even at a double of the price point, well, for a couple things, the value, if we're talking value for dollars, the problem is that there's not a huge market for Moser. So even yeah, at right. that price point, it might not be the easiest watch yeah. to move. The Jorn is gaining steam. So if we're, again, talking value for dollars, black label Jorns, there's probably less than 10 uh, black label CSs make per year. And from a brand that's up and coming and growing, also just, it's butter, man. You put that on your wrist and it's just hot sex, bro. It's really what it is, man. It's it's ridiculous. So, um, so even though the price points are, you know, literally it's going to be like a derivation of two there, it's going to be a you're going to get a much more presence with, with the Jorn. So I love the Moser. I think that Absolutely. if you don't have the $30,000 to spend, the Moser makes a lot of sense. But if you do and you're looking to choose between the two, don't save the money. Pick the Jorn on this one. Right. Absolutely. All right. Next one. This is this the last one? No, we got two more. No, 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 there's one. All right. So we'll, we'll be quick with these two, right? So uh, Jason and I have been talking a lot about uh, of – a lot about Richard Mill in the context of Debethune and back and forth and, and vice versa, right? So Debethune, so you have two brands that have uh, are are very recognizable on the wrist from across the room. Okay, the Richard Mill has taken some time, but it's become a, a, a status symbol, a, uh, a pop culture status symbol, really too, right? So you got rappers, you got athletes. Oh, yeah. People love these watches. In fact, I've sold this exact model to a an NBA player, a friend of mine, and, and he loves it. He's obsessed with it. He's always texting me like, yo, this is the watch. So you have, again, very well-made watches. You have, uh, with a Richard Mill, you're going to get something that's more about, it's more about the man. He's not a watchmaker. He's more a business person, right? So he finds, he finds a case manufacturer, he finds a dial manufacturer, and he puts it together, and he markets it better than anyone else. Uh, I mean, you have, but it's technically, it is an unbelievable watch, right? So you have titanium, you have, uh, a sapphire dial, Sa so you have three slices of sapphire on that watch. You have uh, crystal, dial, case back crystal. Um, you have a uh, a very hardy watch. One thing about Richard Mills is that the reason why they've kind of become status symbols for athletes is because these are watches made to be worn by the their um, by the athletes, the people who are who are advertising these things. So you're going to get a watch that's very hardy, right? Uh, okay, it's absolutely. it's going to take a shock and keep moving. Debethune, uh, sorry, and, and you have a manufacturer that makes roughly 5 million, 5,000 watches a year, not 5 million, 5,000 watches a year. Um, you have Debethune, a, a manufacturer that makes about 150 watches a year. Uh, certainly not one that has caught fire, so so in terms of the hype, it's the Richard Mill here, but you have a watch that's highly recognizable. You have, in this DB28, you have a Turbion, you have Titanium, you have new world engineering and design, old world finishing, whereas everything on the Richard Mill is new world. Yeah. Right. So, price points though, man. You have the RM30. So this is a, uh, it roughly on the wrist. It's tono shaped, so it's not really a 40 millimeter, but it roughly wears like a 40 to 42 millimeter watch. It's titanium. Um, it's a power reserve GMT. That's what you got with that watch in terms of function. Skeletonized. On the Deb Debethune, I mean. So you have uh, 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 spring loaded lugs. Okay, design that's all within itself. You have a moon phase, or it's a day night indicator, I believe. Actually, I have to, Tim will uh, correct me on that. You have a tourbillon, um, and uh, they're both. Are they both manual wind? I can't remember. 
I'm not right. sure, to be honest. So, but you have two very distinct watches. One that's going to be double the price of the other. Now we're talking about a fifty thousand dollars price difference, not a fifteen, but a fifty thousand dollars price difference. So, which one do you pick? I don't know. I, I feel like we're kind of comparing fruits and vegetables here. Really? Yeah. I don't I'll know, disagree, man. and I'll tell you why. But go ahead. I don't know. I mean, I'm basing a lot of this on aesthetics. I mean, we don't see that many of these. Mm -hmm. We really don't. And, and most of the watches that I've handled are. Um, the more higher volume pieces, um, but the De Bethune just looks like otherworldly. You know what a Squale is? I don't. So it's a it's like a very low end watch. We don't really deal in, but I've seen a lot of that. Yeah, I've seen that. I, I did see that in the chat up. several times. Not a not a brand that I'm really too into. Uh, it doesn't. What are we comparing that to? I don't know, man. This is strange. We've <laughs> wow. These guys are going hard, Squale. I don't know where this is coming from. This is very interesting and very funny to me. All right, so, so back to the main yeah, topic. Yeah. Squale. All but, right, you know what? Scrap both these. Let's get a Squale watch <laughs> for two hundred and fifty bucks and call it a day. Save the rest of the cash. But so, so you're gonna get, you're gonna spend one hundred five thousand dollars for a watch that everyone's gonna know you spent one hundred five thousand dollars for, or you spend fifty thousand dollars on a watch that watch guys are gonna know you did your due diligence and got the right watch. That's those are the things. The difference is, and for me, it's hard because I actually do like Richard Mill, but. As Jason Main just stated in the chat. Oh, let's see. The DB28 is the better watch by far. All caps. Oh, God. Orient. You know what an Orient is as well? It's also Orient. like a... Like, I am familiar with that. Yeah. It's like a $200 watch. So, I mean, the, the, it could be cool. I don't know anything about that. I, I've got to give you a kudos being able to do the comments. Mm -hmm. and, and this, I mean, you are... Multi-talented, sir. Uh, yeah, right. Well, some of these people don't think so. I got somebody named John Doe. So an anonymous, oh, an anonymous texter says, uh, "How many? I think. Ask Tim, dude. You pick the watches beforehand. Do some research. Makes you look bad. My job is to look bad, not to do research, my buddy. So if you got a problem, you can call, text, or email me because all my information, my direct information, will be up on the show at the end of the show here. All right, John Doe, enjoy yourself." All right, last one but not least, and this is actually this is actually the most competitive in my opinion. Oh. So we have Rolex versus Omega, both iconic chronographs, uh, both in yellow gold, both with ceramic bezels. Uh, Rolex on a rubber strap, the Omega can be on a rubber strap if you like. One's a forty millimeter, one's a forty two. Uh, one is essentially unlimited supply from Rolex, yep. uh, limited by demand. Yeah. One, uh, the Omega, is limited by design to 292 pieces special edition. So you're going to have, and right now, market price roughly $28,000 for the Daytona. And it says 17, but roughly it's actually $18,000 you're going to pay for that Omega Moon watch. So you're going to pay a little bit below the retail on both these watches. But again, one is limited to 292 pieces. Okay, brilliant blue dial, special edition, and it's full solid gold. And if you uh, if you do any research in this watch, you're going to find out amazing amounts of details, right? And on the Rolex, you have ceramic bezel, you know, amazing fit and finish. A watch that when people see it, they're going to know that you spent some money on it. So, Israel, where are you at? Because I, I, right, I have a feeling so, I know where you're at. Really? Yep. All right. So, I'm a Speedmaster guy. Um, got introduced to Speedmasters when I first started working here. Um, owned several vintage, some modern. Love Speedmaster. However, mm. a Speedmaster... It's stainless steel. It has a black bezel. It has a black dial. It's the Moon Watch. I have to go with the Daytona. Really? So I you're paying. You're paying the twenty. I love Speedmasters. I love them. However, I'll pay the twenty-eight for the Daytona. Really? I, it, it, we're comparing, you know, two of these in precious metal. I think I'm not against a Speedmaster in precious metal. If that's your prerogative, go for it. Right? It's an amazing watch. I love chronographs. Mm -hmm. They're, they're for their utility, I mean, it's it, they're very useful. At work, I you know I just start timing people. How long does it take you to do that? <laughs> well, I use a chronograph when cooking. I mean, it, very useful complications. Obviously, in, in yellow gold, this is more about you know a uh, more about a status symbol or like a, a celebration of uh, a success. No, than, I mean because you can get both these watches at stainless steel. Which, by the way, the price difference is actually going to be a greater difference in stainless steel. You can buy for about three thousand dollars. You can buy. The, Yes. A steel speedy, and you're gonna pay about twenty thousand dollars for the uh, for a uh, um, a steel and ceramic Daytona. So, which is even crazier. Um, 
But all right, so there if you go. So now we're seeing, steel, yeah, absolutely would have went with Speedy. Really, would have went with why, Speedy. Why is that? I don't know. There's just something about the the history behind the Speedmaster, uh, the Moon Watch, um, the way they they age. Mm -hmm. You know, just the way that the bezel gets dented, it it, it fades, all of it. I mean. What's not to if like? If you were paying twenty thousand dollars, you wouldn't be happy about bezels being dented, though. No, and I mean, look, the ceramic bezels are a good representation of like just culturally where we're at today. Sure. We're we're spending more time investing in things that are going to last longer. Mm -hmm. um, technology is advanced, and I, I appreciate ceramic for for that. However, the rest of the watch is going to patina differently, and that bezel is just going to stay there. Hmm. It's not going anywhere. So my buddy John Doe is actually, well, that's a good point. I like yeah. that. So my buddy John Doe has a question for Israel. It says, what low-end watches do you like? So you, you all picked higher price watches. Well, yeah, no, first of all, so, well, so yeah. let me address something. Yeah. It's all relative, my man. Low price, high price, it's all relative. I like some low price watches. My you One of my favorite watches, <laughs> I, own, I own Seven Fridays. One of my favorite watches is an Anonimo. So I can certainly appreciate a watch no matter what the price point is. But Israel... Yeah. Tell so, um, Nomos. Okay. The, uh, but first I think he's talking about lower than that, but go ahead. Lower than that? I mean, I oh, think that's so we're saying. going like, all right. Um, Pre-owned. Pre-owned pre uh, Nomos? Yeah. There you go. No, it doesn't have to be pre-owned Nomos. I mean, it could be pre-owned anything. I mm -hmm. mean, there's so much to be had, especially, uh, I think, um, CQ recently mm -hmm. on one of the videos went into some of the, the brands that are no longer here, and they can be had so cheap. I mean, you go on eBay, and they end up being project watches, but sure, they all have value movements in them. They're all the same. A lot of these manufacturers were case manufacturers in the past, and maybe they made their own dial, but I, you know, I, I, I it's a challenge. Yeah, okay. yeah I, but we're talking, you know, I, no most, what, 2,000 bucks? I, I think that's yeah. reasonable. No, I, I do like no most. Uh -huh. Also, another uh, a German Swiss show. It's German Swiss watch. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys. So uh, I think we're. Uh, I think we reached the end here, man. I think this oh, was. Right. A, this was a fun comparison. You get to see kind of what. Uh, <laughs> I think you get to see what you know. What money's where money's being spent th yeah, uh, no, these absolutely. days, and where you where you can save the money. Uh, also, sorry here. You know what? I want to address this because it is a live show, so I need to. Yeah. Uh, I need to answer. Buddy Kevin said, Kevin S. says, Josh, I thought you gave the Anonymo to your buddy because you didn't like it. That's true. I bought uh, the new one of the new Anonymos. The, it's called a Nautilo. Remember uh, you, one of the new ones that we got in with oh, the yeah, yeah. The one I kept, the one that I'll oh, I'll have forever, is the Anonymo High Dive. So I have an old – I'll post a picture of it on my Instagram later. It's at Mr. Thanos is my uh, – is my Instagram. So you guys can go there and troll that too. Send Squale comments as well. But make sure you follow me first. Um, but uh, – the, my Anonymo High Dive, which is one of the original Anonymo pieces, it was a very limited piece. It's a PVD, but it's beat to shit, man. I think it's scratched up everywhere, which I love. It put it on a NATO strap. That's one I, I'll keep. The Anonymo Natilo wasn't my favorite, and actually I ended up giving it to a friend who really enjoys it and likes it. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, let's see. Nothing. I think we're done here. So, guys, as always, appreciate you coming out and checking us out on a Thursday afternoon. It was a pleasure. Spending some time with us. We want you to like. We want you to comment. We want you to subscribe, which I know you will. Today's viewership was actually pretty well, man. Pretty good. Yeah. We did like like 350 live viewers. That's kind of, that's that's up there for us. What's typical? Uh, less than that. Really? Yeah. Look so, at that. Look at that. And so we're gonna. Oh, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna blame you <laughs> for that. For all these squally lovers. It's a consequence but, of my presence. And there you go. That's right, buddy. <laughs> and we appreciate it. So uh, as always, subscribe. We're up to 78,000 subscribers. Uh, which is too many. We need people to start unsubscribing. We want to stick at 75. So, guys, if you're listening to this, please unsubscribe. Also, follow me on Instagram, Mr. Thanos. Israel, do you have an Instagram? Uh, currently, I do not. Okay, all right. So, no, no Instagram no. for for uh, Israel. No. Check us out on Facebook. Check us out on – where else are we? Are we on Grubhub? We're on there. Okay.